It justifies the prosecution and it justifies the court. And in Sierra Leone's case, this was, I'm suggesting, very high up on the list of priorities of the, the, the prosecution's uh, um, edict, if you like. It's probably as well now to tell you a little bit about the story of the war, because what I'm saying perhaps might find a little more context. This war, as you're probably all aware, was largely about diamonds. And Charles Taylor is being tried at the moment. It's said that he sponsored the RUF. It's said that there is a joint criminal enterprise from ta running from Taylor, or involving Taylor, and the RUF. In order that Taylor could turn Sierra Leone into a satellite state and he could get control of the diamond mines, which are largely up here in the Kono region, uh, and down here in the southeast in the Kenema region, which is about here. Now that may be true, but it's ironic, isn't it, that they have to call someone like Naomi Campbell to try and sustain some link between Taylor and Diamonds. It really is that desperate. <coughs> what the prosecution was saying in the RUF trial was not only that Taylor was sponsoring these individuals, for which there wasn't a shred of evidence adduced in three volumes, um, but uh, that there was this mass grand plan. Now that suited the Sierra Leone government, because when they asked, after the war was over, in I think it was 2001, the UN to set up a war crimes tribunal, they knew what that would entail. More than $200 million has been sunk into this tribunal, which has provided remarkably poor justice. But what it did do was it provided security in the short term in Sierra Leone. It brought jobs. It was manna from heaven to the NGO industry. And basically, a lot of people did very well out of it and probably continue to do so. As I've said, the grand plan justifies the prosecution and justifies the court. That being said, it would have been very embarrassing, wouldn't it, for the court to turn around five years down the road and say, do you know what, we got it wrong. These guys didn't really do it. In the case of Calon and Sese, the two co-defendants, well, they certainly did do it. And let it not be said that I'm for one moment defending the RUF or um, minimizing the, the horror of what went on in that country in the time that I was there, I can tell you that I saw and heard things which um, have a very fundamental effect. They can't fail to. But it's also true that if you're going to uphold somebody's human rights, it's almost inevitable that somebody else's are going to be impinged in some way. And in this case, it was the defendants who paid that price. This war was a very brutal war. Um, it, it, it started in uh, two, uh, I'm sorry, 1991 when there was an invasion from Liberia into this portion of Sierra Leone down here, the southeast. Charles Taylor's uh, rebel forces involving lots of child soldiers came over the border in an attempt to take the diamond mines in these areas here. This had followed coup and counter coup over about a 20 or 30 year period since the British left in 1961. By that time, 61 per capita, third richest country in all of Africa. By the late 1990s, it had been bottom of the World Health Organization's list of developed countries throughout the world for about a decade. So it was ripe for revolution and chaos, and that's what happened. The RUF was set up, really, by this uh, madman, really, called Fode Sanko, and his sidekick, a former disco dancer called San Bokri. Um, to take power back to the people. <coughs> but unfortunately, the RUF were not subject to some grand plan. They were a band of brigands that raped and pillaged across the country for years and years and years. And it was only through interna international <coughs> intervention by 99, 2000 that we finally got rid of them. So nothing to, good to be said about the RUF. But it's the old rule, isn't it? If you're going to have a trial, there's no point in having it unless you make it fair. And in this case, I'm afraid, this trial was not fair. 
The indictment was about 30 pages long. It listed this inventory, this wish list of crimes in, in such a, a, a wide-angled way that victims were never named, there were never any precise dates. Um, it was never described or we were never told which defendant was supposed to have done or commanded which atrocity. We were never told which mode of liability the prosecution was suggesting each accused had, uh, should be liable under. It was essentially the sort of thing from which no one was ever going to escape. Now, the, as I've said, after three years, things were looking pretty good for the Bow defence, because witness after witness had been impeached. Many of these witnesses were former rebels themselves mass killers with everything to gain by giving evidence for the prosecution. So by the end of three years, the prosecution realized that if they were going to nail these three men, they were going to have to do it through JCE because individual and command responsibility wasn't working. And so what they did was they redrafted their pleadings. Now, we in this country would, would never dream of that being allowed towards the end of the prosecution case, much less after it had closed, but that's exactly what they did. <coughs> they redrafted, if we go back to uh, what I was saying earlier on about the common purpose, in order to nail these defendants, they, as I said, redrafted the, the, the common purpose to encapsulate everyone. And they've said that the common purpose was such, and this was accepted by the trial chamber, it was a common plan, purpose or design, joint criminal enterprise, which was, and I emphasize, to take any actions necessary to gain and exercise political power over the territory of Sierra Leone. Now remember, as I said earlier, the common plan, design or purpose, it has to involve the commission of a crime. The only problem with these pleadings was this. Taking any actions necessary to take power in a country is not a crime. That would be to criminalise acts of rebellion. Prosecution had got that wrong. So a year later, in August 2007, they revised their pleadings again to say it was to carry out a campaign of terror and collective punishments in order to pillage the resources in Sierra Leone and control forcibly the population and territory of Sierra Leone. In other words, what we have now is a bifurcated common purpose. The first half of it, take control of the country, not a crime. The second half of it, carry out the campaign of terror, is a crime. But it calls into question all sorts of problems, doesn't it? Because if the common purpose is the committing of unspecified crimes, how is the defendant to know what those crimes are? Are they basic JCE? crimes that were intended by all of those accused? Or are they JC3, crimes that should have been foreseen by the accused? Or a combination of the two? It, it was an appalling mess, very, very prejudicial, should never have been allowed. So how was it um, decided by the trial chamber? Well, having allowed the prosecution to manipulate their pleadings and bring joint criminal enterprise into play and criminalise it, as opposed to the non-criminal common plan that they'd uh, drafted a year earlier, the trial chamber, I should say the majority of the trial chamber, because there was very hot dissent to this from Mr Justice Pierre Boutet, the trial chamber went to work and they manipulated both the law and the facts in order to convict Augustine Bauer. In, as I said, in order to find a joint criminal enterprise um, extent, you have to satisfy various ingredients. You have to show the plurality of persons acting in concert. You have to show the existence of the common plan that involves committing crimes. Well, you have to define what that common plan design or purpose is. What the trial chamber did, and they really hung by their own petard here, was that they decided that rather than there being multiple joint criminal enterprises to, 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 to fit the multiple crimes, there was 
as the prosecution originally put, a grand design. 